Blog Talk Radio. I, I can I hear you over on the other end. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. You're coming in real low. Okay, hold on. All right. All right. Can you hear me? Okay, I hear you. I hear you real well. Okay. Are you hearing me? Absolutely. Yeah, sorry. All for right. Here we are, and we are here to talk with Dr. Kimberly Richard, and uh, I'm super excited about the, about today and to learn with her, John. Yes, absolutely. Um, what the topic is, um, black women organizers, and um, I believe Dr. Richards has spent some time in West Virginia doing organizational work and you specifically asked me and i hope we get it we're going to get an opportunity to speak with dr richards in terms of um uh, she's been all over the planet internationally and what distinctions might there be in doing organization here in the state of west virginia and uh, so i'm eager to be able to ask those questions as well as whatever you might have for dr richards sister Dr. Kimberly Richards. Uh, okay. Let's, so, let's, her in. let's give her a call. She, she's probably waiting. Let's see. Uh, let's get her on the line. Okay. Yeah. Peace. Hello? Peace and greetings. Peace, Peace and greetings. All right. Sister Dr. Kimberly Richards. John Kim and Shabazz L with uh, co-host. Hi, Cri- yes. Sister Crystal, Hi, how are you? I'm so well. I'm so well, yes. yes Very good yes. to hear your voice. Yes, yes. I, I, it, um, I enjoyed researching your work and um, I'm so excited to talk with you for the next hour or so. And um Yes, yeah, so you're you're safe, right? Yeah, I know that you're in transit, but um, that's yes, good. Yes, I am. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, well, well, Crystal, for asking. Yes, I'm I'm, I'm safe. Okay. Well, I want to take charge here, and I I want to be able to extend a, an appreciation quickly to Sister Doctor Kimberly Richards for her work as a organizer over the years, and. Um, as a, as a follow up question, well, 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 quickly, I'd like to be able to give her an opportunity if she could quickly uh, give us some quick details of a uh, summary background of some of her work here, specifically in West Virginia, as this show uh, is attempting to focus on uh, organizational work from Black women in West Virginia. And I know you weren't born in West Virginia, but as I understand, you have done community organizational work here in the state, okay? And well, I'd first, like Brother John, to... what I'd like to do is just introduce okay. myself, because I think just in my yes. basic introduction, it'll give you a feel. Is that okay with you and Sister Crystal? Absolutely. Yes, yes Absolutely. ma'am. Yeah, so I often introduce myself by, you know, we are, as an organizer, there's a lineage. There's a lineage in organizing. There are different traditions of organizing. You know, there's a Saul Alinsky lineage. There is the Industrial Area Foundation lineage. There is the Civil Rights lineage. There is the Ella Baker lineage. And so I just like to, you know, in, a, in the tradition of who I am as an African woman, 
um, grounded in my culture and in respecting of my ancestors, just say that I'm the baby girl of Martha Alford and Henry Richards. I'm the granddaughter of Beulah Midas and Ellie Ball, Georgia Tony and Ben Richardson. And I'm the great, great granddaughter of Lou Ball and Albert Alford, Cynthia and Gus Rideout, Martha and Hugh Harvey. I'm the mother of Allende, Yawara and Kirk. And I'm the grandmother of Kofi, Colin and Aaliyah. I come to you from up south, which means my family's roots in this country are Mississippi. Um, but I was raised in a small town north of Pittsburgh called Farrell, Pennsylvania. And, but I'm currently living in rural, in semi-rural, it's really a bedroom community to New Orleans, a community called Picayune, Mississippi. Picayune is 45 minutes north of New Orleans and um, an hour southeast of where um, my mother, the line of organizers I come from is my grandmother, Beulah, gave birth to my mother in 1926 on the Klondike Sharecrop Plantation in Marion County, Mississippi. And my grandmother would save chicken eggs and sell her breast milk to white women and iron their clothes to raise money to, to, to mm. buy land because she didn't want her to raise her 10 children on, on the Klondike plantation. So my mother, who is still living, I'm actually in transit on route to pick her up at my sister's in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Well, she, at 94 years of age, is still organizing. And my mother was born in 1926. And my grandmother and the line of organizers I come from in the rural South, she was able to, during the Great Depression in this country, buy land that my family still owns and that we organize on. And so that is an hour north of where we live. So I um, okay. have been organizing since I was about in the seventh grade and and that's, that's the line of organizing I come from. And so as you asked me the question around West Virginia, you know, one of the things that as an anti-racist organizer I'm clear about is that the concept and the construct of race doesn't change when it crosses state lines. That black people are treated a certain way in this country, be it West Virginia, North Virginia, East Virginia, South Virginia, Mississippi. And so the clarity around this place and what, what, what constructs racism in this place helps me then take those organizing principles wherever I'm at. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. That was beautiful. Um, I wanted to jump in real quick because um, yes. the way you introduced yourself is so powerful. And, you know, my lineage is, is from, from poetry. So I could give you my poetry lineage and, um, you know, in the, in, the, in the tree and the tradition that I fall from. And, and it just reminded me, uh, recently we heard Amanda Gorman uh, speak at the inauguration. Yes. And it was beautiful. And one of the things that's been circulating in social media is her mantra, where she says, you know, I'm the daughter of writers. We descend from freedom fighters who broke their chains. I can't remember all of it, but it's a, it's a and, and, and uh, Dr. Richardson, that just really sort of gave me a really important thing need to do for myself and really anchor uh, in, in the tradition of who I am and what that means to me in, in my Appalachian roots and my West Virginia roots. Uh, I come from a moon women and I'm actually kind of proud. I'm very proud of that because um, I think, uh, yeah. I think of, uh, of black women running moonshine in West Virginia uh, it must be uh, pretty savvy and pretty smart and uh, pretty Pretty tough women. So um, thank you for yeah. sharing this. It's, it's so important. Um, yeah. So so here we are, and I am so eager to learn because I read your your bio uh, and the work that you've been doing. You know, some of the language and you know, we uh, in West Virginia. I just have to say that these, these are. Uh, I'm curious about your experiences because I find that West Virginia in narrative of anti-racism, I feel that we're very far behind um, in language and movement. And, and so that's just sort of my, that's something I would, I would hope we can discuss what your perceptions are, for, you know, there. but also, you know, what can, what can we do in a program like what John and I are doing, um, you know, to start to educate people around the term anti-racism, even racism, uh, white I mean, these these words I feel have 
uh, have little definition um, in, in the present moment. As you know, as you talk, Crystal, I'm hearing you better and better. Initially, in your question, it was very difficult for me to hear you. So I just want to be able to kind of process what I heard with you and then be able to to connect back to what Brother John was saying. I think I can weave both things in just around, you know, my, my engagement in community organizing. So part of what I think I heard you say was, because, again, I, I don't hear you as clearly. It's like we have a bad connection or something, but we're going to work with it. Um, what I think I heard you say is that in West Virginia, that you come from some strong, moonshining women who were brilliant and who were risk takers and who for them to be able to do what they did, they had to be that, and that our ability to connect with our lineage gives life. That's the first thing I heard. The second thing I heard was that in West Virginia, there seems to be a, um, a delay in people's ability to address issues of race and racism and anti-racism because it may be um, that the movement in that, in that way may be a little slower there, and, and then on the last part is what I heard the least. Okay. And she was kind of breaking up a little bit there. I, I didn't want to interrupt her, but I noticed that you were breaking up a little bit there, Crystal. Crystal? Yes, we may, have, we may have totally lost her. Okay. Well, we're going to have to go on, uh, uh, sister, uh, Dr. Richards. So did, did, you hear, uh, that, did you hear the last thing that she said? I, uh, I didn't hear that. It, it, it started breaking up so badly there. Um, I, uh, I'm going to have to change gears and ask you about the June, the June, the Juneteenth work that I had previously asked you about in, uh, in passing, uh, well, as I, in terms of, Oh, well, excuse me. Go ahead. Excuse me. Uh, you well, clarify I, your I, last I wanted, to, I wanted comments. to honor your I wanted to honor your um, your initial question around organizing because when you asked that question, I asked if I could introduce myself, and I don't know if in that introduction the question was answered. I and so I wanted okay. to, to make sure okay. that okay. Well, we that better go back to that. Had got covered. Yeah. If, okay, because because I did ask you about your experiences as an organizer in West Virginia specifically, and uh, that's important to the orientation of this show. And uh, it had been my, it, I think it is my understanding that you, I know you've been in the state, okay. And I told Crystal that the organizational work, same thing you previously said, that the organizational work that we do is generally just organizational work that can be tweaked from area to area. I myself organized in western Pennsylvania, okay, and had been through Pittsburgh as as well as Fairmont and Morgantown in, in, the, in the upper Monongahela River Valley. So I kind of view all the area as the same area that may or may not have to be tweaked based upon what's going on locally, okay? The same formula right. will work from, from area to area, okay? Um, and, I, I, and I sense from what you said, you basically have you no know, once you have a formula that works it can be tweaked on the local you know from from state to state city to city and uh so there's really no difference uh in terms of where we're at and uh well in terms of the whole in, in terms of what is called america the united states uh once you look at it from a proper perspective okay and i think that's one of the things that uh one of the reasons why you, you at one time mentioned to me that we have to do a series on racism because racism has to be properly defined. I, I know last week we did a show called Surviving Racism where I had to, um, I had to get proper definition from our great ancestor, Sister Dr. Francis, Francis Cress Welsing. And, and her definition for racism was at least a paragraph long, okay? And, and we have made it succinct and completed the show. But it kind of set up a, set us up to be able to deal with today's show in terms of great black women organizers. And I know that uh, defining racism is proper. And um, I'd, uh, so I, I'm going to uh, let you speak to, um, in terms of your organization here in West Virginia, Dr. Dr. Richardson. Let's see if we can get Crystal back on the line. 
I'm, I'm gonna give her a text. But uh, could you do that for me, Doctor Richards? Sure, sure. Okay. Um, first, let me just say it's a real pleasure and a, a honor to be on the show with you all and to be supporting the good organizing that you're doing. Um, so, I guess first, even before I would speak with a level of specificity about organizing in West Virginia. I don't know what you all have shared with your viewers. You've talked about a definition of racism. Have you all talked about a definition of organizing, of community organizing? Uh, we have not talked about a, a proper, I, I thought about that today, as a matter of fact, in terms of a, a definition of what organizing means. Uh, and I think it's necessary to have a clear definition of that as well. Okay, so it's and I, get, so, you know, I, so we so we look at you talk about organizing um, anywhere. It's really important to know what what is meant by organizing. So right, you speak you speak yourself as an organizer, right? I, I see myself as an organizer based upon, and I think there's experiences that define that. Um, uh, I did work with an organization called Black Men for Progress, organizing for the Million Man March. And so there was actually experiences connected to that, okay, where I could be able to uh, define myself as an individual before getting validation from others, okay? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so yeah, I do see myself as an organizer. Uh, uh, and, and, and initially, I didn't necessarily see myself as an organizer. Okay, I didn't really. But then, I, when I looked at the detail work that is necessary to pull off events, uh, I began to define myself properly as an organizer. When the money came in and had my name on it, said organizer, meaning that I, I defined myself as an organizer. But once I, other people or other groups started recognizing me as an organizer, it bolstered my own position as an organizer. I think, I hope I'm coming across clear, okay? Cause, no, I, yeah, uh, so, you know, because you were initially, it sounds like you were doing work in your community to make a difference and working with Black Men for Progress to attend an event is a part of what, how you were able to apply your skills and to do some work that you saw as valuable and then it was affirming when others validated you in that work in whatever way that that validation came. Is that right? That's what you're saying? Well, yes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah, and then, so, see, so yeah. that, event, that, e that event planning is a part of organizing. And so right. what we what we we simply define organizing is bringing people together for an intended purpose to shift power. Okay. Organizers yeah. bring people together for an intended purpose, and that's a part that the organizers, you know, being clear on what that intended purpose is is really important and to shift right. power. And so yeah, there yeah. are organizers in any number of different settings. You have organizers okay. in families. You have organizers in neighborhoods. You have organizers in churches. You have organizers in institutions. You have organizers really anywhere you have people. You have organizers. Okay. The question just okay. becomes what kind of organizer are you? And for what purpose are you organizing? And is it to shift power or is it to maintain the power imbalance? Okay. Because some people that call themselves organizers are activists. There's a difference between being an activist 
and being an organizer. Some people who call themselves organizer, organizers are disorganizers. Mm-hmm. Some mm-hmm. are organizing without a set of, but I, I call myself an anti-racist organizer, which, okay. you have, which being guided by a set of values and principles that are shared in the group so that I can have a practice a practice and not a hobby or not a every now and again, but a practice of being right. engaged and embodying these principles and values um, that hold me accountable and how I engage with my community and the principles and values that I use to be in accountable relationships with other people. Did you, okay. Have you been able to get any intel on Sister Crystal? Is she all right? Well, uh, I text her back and and check with her. This is this is not the first time this has happened. Uh, she, oh, okay. She, we're also yeah. This is not. I mean, this is not just with her. This is with other people as well. They're, they're, they've been having difficulty with blog talk. Um. I have some other questions here that are important, though, uh, in terms of now you identified organizers that bring people together for an, for an intended purpose. I like that. I'm going to snatch that and use that as a clear definition of what an organizer is. And you took some time to detail. I, you know, I had also thought I had thought about the, the, the differences, the distinctions between activists and organizers. Some organizers are, are also activists. Some activists are also or organizers. But you know, then and uh, so you do have to get clear definitions. And some of, uh, and some are advocates. You know, right. being, You know, and, and some are advocates. And you know, some right. some provide service. So being clear in your role is very important. That we don't mm-hmm. use the language loosely. Because our community, you know, they, they, they demand or they should demand, they, they require us to come correct, for us to come right. committed, for us to come clear, for us to come clean. Our communities require that of us. And so, so that we go in, you know, wanting to be more effective, doing good work, coming in with our hearts. But... Ultimately, you know, as an organizer, if you call a meeting and you call that meeting two or three times and nobody comes, it's important that the organizer not blame the community, but the organizer understand that I need to change my approach. Mm, I need to change my approach. Not something's wrong with the community, but I'm not as effective as I want to be in reaching my community. So what is my community trying to tell me that says I need to come at this a different way. Because I'm, but see, we're 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 socialized and conditioned to not say I'm ineffective or you know I need to come at this differently. We're socialized to say something's wrong with them. Okay. Something's okay. wrong with them. They don't want nothing. They have apathy. They won't come out. But no, you see, mm. there was a bunch of you before you showed up on the scene in that community. And so they've seen right. people come before with the yoki dope. Right, right. So so, so, talking so and people in the community. and they, they diving go- and ain't right. producing nothing. And right. so the community well, is rightfully so suspect. What you coming with right. this time? You know, right. so we have to be able to 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 tap into the the spirit, the history, the lessons, the learnings of any community, be it West Virginia, be it West LA, be it Southwest right. Garden. We have to be able to tap into the presence and the history and the lineage of the people 
And Absolutely. our ability to tap into that was the, is then connected to our ability to be effective in that community. Not the people, mm-hmm. it's us as the organizers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I see the June you know, team. If we're gonna if we're gonna flip it, if we're gonna flip it, we gotta flip it all away, right? So we also gotta right, flip right. our understanding of the problem. Because I know a lot of people talking about, I'm gonna flip it. I'm gonna flip it. Well, I'm willing to flip it too. So let's flip it at looking at how we can be better. Right, right. How we can well, be more effective, know, and not how now, the community can get more involved. Sister Doctor Kimberly, Doc. I um I I wanted to tell you that we see the Juneteenth as an opportunity to organize our own event. Uh, we've been doing a Juneteenth here in this area since 2011, and we had some difficulties with it initially. It, I use it kind of like it's a litmus test because initially the churches kind of was kind of hands off with it. They didn't want to mess with it, and the churches didn't really come. And we kept we pulled we we, we did the first one in 2011, and we kept. Do, consistently doing the Juneteenth, but in 20, it took uh, all the way up until 2019 for the churches to finally come out and support the Juneteenth. So, so what I'm telling you is, it had, we had to put some consistent work in for the Juneteenth. You know, and, and not, nothing against the church because I'm out of the That's church right. too. I, I, okay, but it just took the church a while. It, they well, they they were I think they were a little suspect. Like you said, uh-huh. sis. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, let's uh-huh. sit back. We didn't see these guys come through as con artists, and we we. Uh-huh. So you got to put the so you got to put the you actually do have to put the work in, and That's right. yes, because we put the work in. And I said when I say we, because if it was me, I'd say me, but it ain't me. It's we, and we can be able to look back now and say we have some credentials based upon our ex- past experience. You know, we pulled. Through, you know, 2019 was fantastic. We got. And I, I talk about the Juneteenth because it actually is us spearheading, spear, spearheading the organizational efforts. We're in control of it, and it's necessary for other Black people to see that. I get excited. Right. I get uh, excited about it. Right. It's like other slaves seeing a free Black man riding a horse or driving a Cadillac, and he's uh-huh. not being harassed. <laughs> But, but, uh, but I, I, I just, uh, I had asked you earlier about your own experience with organizing Juneteenth. Uh, and, uh, it happens that West Virginia, uh, you know, we got a resolution or I think the, um, uh, a minority affairs group is going to be presenting some litigation or some legislation, excuse me, to the West Virginia legislator in 2021 in reference to the Juneteenth, which has went national. You know, and uh, you expressed to me, I want you to share your experiences with uh, Juneteenth, Dr. Richards. And I, I'm going to be quiet, right, because I want to listen to what you have to say. Well, are, are you there, um, Dr. Are, Richards? Okay. Yes, yes, I'm here. Can you okay. hear me? Yes, yes, ma'am. I can hear you. Okay. Um, well, you know, before there was Juneteenth, you know, I guess people have been celebrating Juneteenth. You know, it's been a movement that has, you know, been happening, I guess, maybe the last 50 years or so. But, you know, before, mm-hmm. you know, as I think about Juneteenth, I also think about, you know, Marcus Garvey Day. Um, you know, I think about back in the 70s going to D.C. for Malcolm X Day, you know, in the park there and the drummers coming out and drumming and the dancers dancing. So, you know, we have we have been able in this country to use events that celebrate our coochie chocolate, our self-determination, that celebrate our Imani, our faith, that celebrate our Koumba, our creativity, that we have been able to, we have a history of celebrating in the face of efforts to be dehumanized, in the face of the peculiar institution, we have figured out ways to celebrate. And I, what I really like that you're saying is that you are part of a group that is not you as an individual, um, and that is so healthy. I have a friend that says, ill is spelled I-L-L. Um, but if you put 
you know, take that I away and put we, it will take mm-hmm. you to wellness because the individual I you know, is, is, is ill, as the young people say. That's ill. So, you know, you're ill when you're by yourself. But when you're a part of a team and a collective, that then are, it, it's a reflection of our community being well because the last thing that our community needs is an individual because, you know, it says then that the community can't, doesn't have its own leadership and doesn't have its own ability to have agency. But when more of us are together and we're building and we're growing stronger, that then an event like Juneteenth is an event that can allow you to, to strengthen your base and to celebrate and to recruit more people and to get more ideas and to, again, tap into what are the purposes that people need and want to gather to to bring people together in that specific area around whatever it is. So, you know, the June, when I was in college back in Atlanta in the 70s, You know, we did Marcus Garvey Day, we did um, Malcolm X Day, and so that really set me up to when I got exposed to Juneteenth, you know, later on, um, to be able to do the Juneteenth uh, celebrations in a number of different cities. I've participated in some and been a part of organizing some. And if it wasn't Juneteenth, it it was an event like that that brought us together. You know, uh, uh, Farrell, Pennsylvania, and Southwest Gardens was a part of my organizing base. And we at Southwest Gardens did not do Juneteenth. We just did a day in the park, a Southwest Gardens day in the park and a weekend. And it really cultivated the soil for our, for Farrell, which came about 10 years later to do Juneteenth. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, Juneteenth okay. is being being recognized more and more in this, but because you you wouldn't at least in Farrell to the degree Farrell does a great Juneteenth. But before there was Juneteenth, there was Day in the Park, and Day in the Park right. is kind of in my mind what prepared the soil to see what you all did by having the Juneteenth, you know, seven or eight years before some of the other institutions like the church that you wanted to get involved to get involved, you're absolutely right. They had to check y'all out. They had to see if you were just some charlatans figure out, figuring out how to distract the community or how to divide the community or how to siphon resources out of the community as other groups that have come before have done or if you were really about the community. So, you know, it's great that you all put the work in. It's great that you all were able to build from an I to a we. And those kind of events just Mm -hmm. um, make the community stronger. Because the last thing our community needs is to be dependent on one individual in a leadership role. And everybody else is, um, you know, stuck. Right, right, that's, right. You know, that's not healthy. That's not our, our, that's not a part of community wellness. Well, right, and and, and that's uh, you, you're looking at things from, for instance, a holistic perspective. That uh, because uh, cause in organizing, I I do I, sometimes it's necessary to take a leadership role, okay, and be the initiator so people can see an example. Somebody willing to spend time and energy out there trying to get things done, even if it's passing out flyers. Okay, with right. information on right. it. Okay, so so I've you know a lot of times I've some a lot of times. And, but but some as long as that I, person isn't working by themselves, even yeah, though taking yeah. a leadership role means you have to be out there with flyers, but mm-hmm. it is a part of a leap because a leader means what? What does a leader mean? So we talk about defining organizing. What does a leader mean? How do you define well, a leader? Uh, I, I, well, when, uh, that's a good question, but when when I think of a leader, I think of someone that's willing to take the risk and be the first one to do something, be the example well, of the model. That's a risk taker. That, 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 that's a risk taker. That's that, that not that's not necessarily a leader. That's a risk taker. And you're right. Leaders okay. definitely take risks. 
leaders definitely take risks. But but, okay, but what, well, how leader you means someone that someone he has followers, someone that's there a risk taker with followers. There you go. A leader okay. has followers. Some people yeah. say they it leader, to make but ain't nobody following them. Yeah, right. A leader has followers. Right. Right. That's a good point. Yeah, I know when we have a conversation with Sister Dr. Kimberly Richards, you're going to get educated. <laughs> okay. But um, um, Sister, um, as an organizer, I'm going to change gears. What is your view on the impact of Black Lives Matter on a new generation of activists and organizers? I, uh, every, every movement has had its specific organization. You know, there was SNCC, there was CORE, there was the Black Panther Party, there were black student unions all over the country. That each each time frame, or as as people say, moment and not movement, but the movement has had moments, right? The movement has had moments. The movement mm. for racial justice, the movement for an elevated humanity, the movement for human dignity, has had moments. And so in this Black Lives Matter moment, it is important for the movement to continue moving and speaking to the lives and the realities of black people and black young people and the way that the systems and institutions say that black life doesn't matter, be you young or old. And so I believe that movement is important and I think part of the movement, a part of the conversation, part of the organizing has to have an outward-looking face, and it has to have an inward-looking face. And I just don't know how much we are talking about the inward-looking face. And I'm patient, and I'm, you know, a part of different places where that conversation is happening. But I think that we have been told so long that black lives doesn't matter, that we also have to reconnect to our lives mattering, and then what choices we make and what we do differently to value ourselves in the face of a system that has devalued us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Now, with young people, I know you're an educator. It's like listening to Dr. Frances Quest Walsing, and she's not here. You give long definitions, but as we talked about earlier, Racism is has has long definitions to it, and it's in order for it to, in order for you to be able to deal with it sufficiently. So, um, I um, you know, Doctor Press Welsing is one of my patron saints. So, for you to even put your my mouth in your mouth with hers is just very 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 inspirational. She is to me. Very, um, well, we got to carry her. We got to carry her. Yeah, yeah. I quote yeah, her all the yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, be, because, uh, I mean, uh, well, we have sister, and we're talking about black women organizers, but the educate the political education process, I believe, must come first. Okay, especially if you have if if, if you have if your background consists of Western education. That's uh, that's, I talked with Sister Sister uh, Crystal about this. How Afrocentric education, being able to study the scholars that have stuttered that that were studying the race issue and were giving specific attention to it. Uh, You know, I I I partly grew up in white-dominated areas, and this is one of the reasons why I could be able to relate to organizing in West Virginia because I had already dealt with particularly white dominated areas and had been discriminated against directly. Uh, this goes to how, uh, for instance, growing up and organizing in Western Pennsylvania relates to West Virginia 
because I'm that okay. model. I can speak on it myself, okay? I've experienced discrimination, whether it be in West Virginia, whether it be in Western Pennsylvania, whether it be in Ohio. Right. I've looked and seen the disparities that exist, not just in West Virginia or in one specific county or one specific city, but it's, it's national. There's evidence. That's right. I think you and I talked about that at one time years ago, uh, uh, Sister Doctor. Uh, and, uh, you know, looking at it like that, uh, so there's not really much distinction, but we know if one area uh, stands up and fights back against systemic racism and gets things done, makes things happen, if it works for them, it should be able to work for us. Okay, we just got to tweak it to our a condition on the local level. Yeah. So that's one of the things, and that takes proper definition, as you talked about, uh, the, 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 the being able to define and properly label things on the national as well as being able to define and properly label things on the local level and then linking people up. As uh, I heard someone say, connecting dots. Okay. Uh, um, you, know, Pens- you know another thing Pittsburgh- that's important about leaders? Oh. Go ahead, sis. In addition excuse to me. having a following. You know, oh, yeah, no, excuse me. I mean, you know, in, in dialogue, it's hard to sometimes just wait for the person to get done because you want to have a conversation. So I don't mean to cut you okay. off, but, you know, so much of what you're saying is sparking another thought or a question in me. So one thing that came to mind is that another part of a definition of a leader, in addition to having a following, to kind of take that to the next step, a leader then moves that following to leadership and not just membership. Mm. Right. Leaders make leaders. True leaders build leaders. Yeah. If all a leader has is a following, then that leader is manipulating people. Mm -hmm. If all that leader has is a following. Because the question is, who holds that leader accountable? Who holds the leader accountable? And a lot of times people will put themselves in a leadership role and the community did not ask them to speak for them. Right, right. But you're going to speak for the community, but you ain't speaking to the community. So how we can speak for the community when the community hasn't told us what they want for us to say? And I say it just like I mean it, what they want for us. Since we're speaking for them, then we got to find out what they want for us to say. And if we're not engaged and what are the in vehicles our community, do... what's no, that? No, I was, I, was, I, was, I was asking you, what are the vehicles where you in, engage, you know, the community to find out exactly if you if you, you have striving a, you have for a, you leadership? You have a community meeting. You have a community meeting. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Okay. You hold a and that, that, meeting, or you go, or, or you bring up the conversation where people are already naturally meeting the brothers in the barber shop, the sisters in the beauty mm-hmm. shop, the the, uh, the, 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 the fellowship, uh, talk, uh, saying a few words for folks at church. I'm representing right, you right. on this, that, and the third. I'm going to Morgantown next week. I'm going to talk about criminal justice. What kind of message? Does this church body, what you know, what, what kind of questions do you have of me who represent you, and what message do you like for me to go and take them back, and you know, and how, and how have you raised their conscious consciousness if when you ask them that question, they not clear or talking some yucky dope? It's not a matter of saying, right. oh, they don't, they don't, they don't know what they want. I'm not. Then how do you raise their consciousness so that you're not the only one with consciousness? Right, and, and that takes the effort. That take it, that would take effort to 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 go through that process, okay? And but, so, see, that's why you use the eight years that you took to build to get the churches. Now that you got a foot in the in the in the churches, you then say you you know that there, that there are some either history classes or some conversations that people who are supporting Juneteenth and want to organize it. You want to make sure that people know about what Juneteenth is and the liberation. You know what I'm saying? So that you use Absolutely. the event. You want to use the event to raise consciousness. 
Some people just right, see an activist right. just get caught up in the event. That's an activist. That's the difference between an activist and an organizer. And right. Activists activist could be for the get moment. Caught up into the event, to the event. Right, 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 right. I, I, activists could be temporary, but then, but then you could be going to a bunch of different events. Activate, so, that's right, but 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 no, but going in what's scattered all over the place, just going to events, yeah. not really raising no consciousness, not really developing no base, not really developing more leadership. You can't you can't develop a whole lot of leadership if all you're doing is going to events. Right, how's that right. development? The organizers planning. Organizers planning, more Strate- strategic. Strategically, strategically planning. Right, right. And understanding right, right. that Understood. you want to use the event to develop people. Because our community is going to always have an event. It's going to always have an issue. Mm-hmm. Always going to have an mm-hmm. issue. So it's not about getting all excited and been out of shape about the issue. It's about how you as an organizer are strategically using the issue to build a base of support and in your community, because an individual is not going to transform the system, not an individual, or not even two. You got to have a base. Mm -hmm. That's what we saw on January the 6th. It was a base of people. Like it, love it, hate it, be indifferent. But we saw organizing on January 6th, effective strategic organizing. They were effective. They got up in the. They got up in there. They got up in there. That shit was effective. Uh, uh, hey, uh, you're talking about that incident on January 6th. That was, I, I, you know, I was speaking to someone close to me. I said, "Man, look, if my grandfather was around the day. Some of the old people was to be able to see that. What would they say? <laughs> you know, huh. That was something huh. else. That's all I." Organizing. It was organizing. Yeah. It was yeah. organizing. I don't. I don't know if you would. I don't know. Well, you say it's organizing. I don't know if we would want to tie organizing into that. I guess that's organizing in a negative way. It looked like terrorism yeah, to me. I don't yeah. know what. It, yeah. It was yeah. I mean, but I mean, whether whether you whether you like what they did or not, whether you judge what they did or not, I'm not in support of it at all. But I'm just saying. Yeah. I'm just it's saying. A nasty. It's a nasty look at America. I was t- I was speaking to someone else but about that, but, right? But it's the heart. It's the heart yeah. of America. America was yeah, that's born a nasty in that look. kind of violence. America was you know? born in that kind of violence. The late Dr. Francis Chris Welsing says, if you take the letters that we use to spell the word America, and you scramble the letters up, you get the phrase "I am race." We are a nation built on the violence. Of racism, this country is built in that blood. That's why they yeah, call themselves yeah. patriots. But no matter uh, what you, you know, think about them or how horrific, it was organizing. They had an intended purpose. They brought yeah. people together, right? Yeah, they brought people yeah, together. They, yeah, 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 they, they brought, brought people, people together, together for an intended purpose. Yeah, they brought people together for an intended purpose. Okay, sister. Uh, you said you, you said you want to talk about organizing, so we have some examples. <laughs> yeah. uh, you said you want to talk about organizing, so okay. we have some examples of organizing in this time we're in right now that we have to look at and acknowledge, whether we like it or not, that you have to be able to call a thing a thing. That was organizing. Right, right. Like now, it or not. Now, 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 okay. Now, I, I, I don't like it, but let's look at it like this. I, I see in a, in a, let's say, to add on to what you said, I see it as a backlash to previous successful organizing from a, from other parties that got together and organized to, and it, so right. I see it as that's a, right. I would agree with you. The backlash a, organizing. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and using it's the energy. Clap back. That's a clapback. Yeah, that's a clapback. Yeah, <laughs> my goodness. Yeah. I think some of that could have also been proper uh, propag- propaganda, uh, meaning that it was a. Uh, it, it looks like an inside job. It's, a, you know, I asked people that's that. I asked people that. That's, that's organizing. 
an inside job. Yeah, and yeah. That's or infil- infiltration. What are the other efforts of organizing that were infiltrated? Mm-hmm. Well, um, I uh, I wanted to ask you some more questions in terms of your um, when it, when it comes to specifically when it comes to undoing racism. I, I have to change gears a little, but when it comes to undoing racism. In your work specifically with European Americans, do you ever find that they um, admit to benefiting from racism and make uh, 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 some do. Uh, change their some lives? Do. Well, I mean, I can't say they change their lives because I don't. You know, I think they make efforts. Yeah. But I, I don't. You know, I don't track them in terms of following right. their lives. But, but you know, I I know. You know, more and more in this in this time, more and more people are acknowledging. People have started acknowledging privilege. I think without understanding what that really means, white privilege mm-hmm. or white fragility. You know, there are a lot of books. Robin DiAngelo has a book. She, you know, had studied our work and wrote a book called White Fragility. Um, you've got other people doing courageous conversations work. Or um, there's another book. Uh, I might think of it before the end of uh, the the session. Have you heard from Sister Crystal? No, we Did haven't heard from Crystal. I'm going to probably yeah, and, and our show's probably getting ready to end here in the next five minutes. And uh, hold, hold, your hold. She did give me a text back. Hold on, let me. Uh, she did. Uh, let her. Yeah, she told me to tell you to let her let you close. Okay, so we're going to close out. Okay. Well, well here's, here's what down. happens with our. Well, no, here's what happens with our show. We get the show, and uh, the, you'll hear the music come in. We'll start closing out at that time. Okay. So, so we're still good. Uh, while so, I got and, you on the she, line, is those, she able to listen? Is Sister Crystal able to listen? I think she, she. Yeah, she's. Yeah, she's able to listen. Okay, oh, she'll Sister get the recording. Crystal? Yes, well, I just want to be able to say to you, thank you for being a part of this organizing that you're doing with Brother John. I appreciate your commitment and love for West Virginia. Um, And as you spread your wings to continue your organizing and broadcasting in California. And so I truly look forward to us reconnecting at a time when we have a stronger connection because whether or not the telephone is connected, I felt a connection from you that I would really like to continue. And I know that because of Brother John's commitment to community and justice, that if you're somebody working with him, then you're good people with me. And so this is really the first time I've ever done a podcast. So I am honored and thrilled. Yeah, this is my first podcast, y'all. So I was contacted uh, recently about doing another one, but... I can say that, uh, what's the name of the show again? This is Black by God uh, with uh, producer host Crystal Good and John Kimmich Shabazz of the Shabazz Report. I, you know, I do the Shabazz Report on YouTube where I have a library, I uploaded a library of my videos and so forth. This is only part one. Well, uh, how many, how many little mentees Kim- you got? You gotta have some. I want to meet huh? some of your mentees, some of the young brothers you are training up in this work. You know, you know what? Army. I, I do want, have. I, some... I, I want to meet some of. Your, I want to meet some I of your you, mentees. Sister. Yeah, I want well, to meet well, some well, of your soldiers. Well, well, what happens with these brothers, right? And you know, we we had these brothers in the study group. They've all went off to be Moors. I'm just gonna keep it real. <laughs> They're Moors now, so they they they, they navigate independently. But we do come together periodically as a, in, a, in a collective. Oh, and it always well, feels good. good to, yeah, and, and I hear our music in the background. And I, Crystal hooked us up on a wonderful. She she got a beat from one of her friends out in California. Brother named Aziz, and uh, I tell her about this beat. I, say, Aziz, I love this is beat. Aziz, is, is Aziz originally from Philadelphia? I might know Aziz. Is he, is he, he may, is he may or may Philly? not be. I think and I he know may, his he partner, Marjani, Marjani Forte. Okay. That's Aziz's uh, wife. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, she, she uh, it's a hip hop beat. But uh, I was going to tell you about Sister, uh, Sister uh, Reverend Katie Davis from Reedsville, West Virginia, that would leave on a regular and make that trip to Camp West Middlesex in West Middlesex, Pennsylvania. She was an organizer in the church. So, you know, and, you know so we have these queen mothers that are initiators and, they, you know, she could have, she's a risk taker. But she's also a planner and, and, and works to assess who can come in and help her uh, achieve these goals. And for her, I think, she Camp, I read her leadership. book. She, she develops leadership. She got soldiers. She got soldiers. And they, and they got soldiers camped out. You're talking about the Underground Railroad. The same policy yeah. was implemented by these early uh, brothers and sisters from out of Camp Middlesex. Uh, a home for us, okay, I say us because that's something that we have in common is Camp Middlesex. And I, I, I and uh, I'm, you know, as we close. Is the show still um, on, John? Yes, the show is still on. And we, we're closing. Uh, we're, we're on. We're on every Sunday, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can uh, hit the link, www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash black by God or you can listen straight from your cell phone at 516-666-9488 okay this is black by God and this Shabazz report we'll holler at you next week sister Kimberly I got love for you all right thank you brother John thank you brother John I got love for you and your organizing